Good morning, friends, and welcome to week two of Worship from the Dining Room. Uh, this is a, a second week of experimenting with uh, projecting and for uh, live streaming for the Essex Center United Methodist Church. And this week uh, with the Reverend Barbara Lemmel, tell us a little bit about your community. So this week we're doing a joint stream to the Essex Center United Methodist Church and also to the United Community Church of Morrisville. So for those of us in Morrisville, this is our first time doing a live stream. Uh, our hope is that this works for you. Um, if not, you can always watch it um, afterwards with the recording. Um, but with any luck, this is a joint stream to both of us. And to the folks in Morrisville, I want to introduce the Reverend Mitchell Hay, uh, who's my spouse and who pastors Essex. So uh, we'll try this together. We also want to uh, say thank you and welcome to uh, Will, who is gonna be reading scripture today, and Jeremy, our tech wizard, who is uh, in Cambridge right now and is uh, making sure things run as smoothly as possible. And without Jeremy, none of this would be possible. So thank, thank you, you, Jeremy. Thank you so much. Uh, a few caveats that were the same as last week. Uh, this is our living room. Uh, we have a dog who barks, a cat who meows, and three college orphans who make all sorts of noises. So uh, if you hear stuff, welcome to real life. We all have that. But what we're here for is to take time to worship. And Barb will introduce our call to worship. So um, if you got the Word document, those folks in Morrisville, or if you, you got the uh, newsletter piece in Essex, the worship is there. But the call to worship, you don't need any words. It comes to us out of the African-American community. And Mitch and I will do it as a call response, but it's very simple. I say, God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. So this is one of those calls to worship that's easy to say when things are going well. So yesterday I was in the parking lot in Taft's Corners and all of a sudden I heard this beautiful bird song and I looked up and there was a strawberry finch singing its heart out in one of the trees in the middle of the parking lot in front of Bed Bath & Beyond. And it made me want to say, God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. I got to do a final day of skiing uh, this week with my daughter and the conditions were the best all year. It was exquisite. The sky was a bluebird blue and all I could think was God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. And one of the reasons this call to worship is so meaningful for me is because it comes out of the African-American community in the United States, which is no stranger to hardship and oppression and pain and death. And even in the midst of those hard times for hundreds of years, African-American folk have been turning to each other on Sunday morning or whenever they gather together in worship, sometimes with tears on their faces and saying, God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Even this week for me, when I was helping out at the food pantry, where we could no longer have one-on-one -on -one connections with the people we were feeding because they had to be in a car where we gave them prepackaged groceries and it felt like we were losing so much of the human touch that we love when we do ministry. Still, God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. So whether you're coming to this worship service um, lonelier than usual because you can't get out and people can't come see you, or whether you're coming completely stretched thin because there are more people in your house than you're used to, or your job is asking for more hours than you ever thought possible, we invite you still to join in saying, God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. In your worship bulletin, if you have it, there is an opening to God time that comes from the Northumbria Celtic community in Scotland, a, um, a riff on an ancient prayer called St. Patrick's Breastplate. So I invite you to breathe deeply, breathe in as though it's the very presence of God's spirit, breathe out all that separates us from God. 
and hear these words from St. Patrick. Christ as a light, illumine and guide us. Christ as a shield, overshadow us. Christ under us, Christ over us. Christ beside us on our left and our right. This day be within us and outside us. Lowly and meek yet all powerful. Be in the heart of each to whom we speak. Be in the mouth of each who speaks to us. Christ as a light, Christ as a shield. Christ beside us on our left and our right. Amen. Amen. So one of our, so both our scriptures this morning are from the common lectionary reading for this Sunday. Um, it's one of those happy Holy Spirit accidents, I think, that the psalm for this Sunday is the 23rd Psalm. It's a psalm that we so often read together at funerals and times that are difficult. Um, you may know this psalm already. You may have it before you in the worship bulletin, but I'm going to invite all of us to say this together. So let's join together in this psalm this morning. The Lord, Lord is, is my, my shepherd. shepherd. I, I shall, shall not want. want. He makes, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Will Skolachenko is our reader today. Uh, you may recognize him from uh, advertisements for the ski rack on the radio. And it's been a pleasure to have him a part of our faith community. The reading comes from the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John. This is a, a story that is both, uh, has a lot of pathos and also a lot of comedy. I invite you to read the entire uh, scripture, all of chapter nine on your own. Um, it comes off as a dark comedy in a lot of ways. But the very beginning that we'll read today is a, is a story of healing and a story of reconnection into community. And uh, so, Will, I invite you to uh, share the word with us today. All right. Good morning, everyone. And as he was walking along, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples questioned him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but the works of God must be made manifest in him. It is necessary for us to perform the works of the one who has sent me while it is day. The night comes when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay from the spittle and anointed his eyes with the clay and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means when interpreted, sent forth. So he went and washed and came back with sight. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Will. So there is an old story about a wealthy Texas rancher who comes out east to visit his second cousin, a Vermont dairy farmer, who still worked their mutual great-great-grandparents plot of land up in the Northeast Kingdom. So how big a farm is this anyways, demanded the Texas rancher. And with immense pride, the Vermonter replied, 
that it stretches all the way from the river down there up to the road, the dirt road up there, and all the way from that grove of sugar maples over there down to the town line at the bottom of the hill. Now, bewildered, the Texas began to ask how anyone could profitably farm from such a small patch of ground. When the Vermonter politely asked him in turn, how large was his cousin's Texas ranch? And with matching pride, the Texan replied that, well, if I get into my tractor at the crack of dawn to inspect the perimeter fence, it would be lunch before I reached the southern limit and the sun would be setting as I return to the northern reaches of my land. And the Vermonter sympathetically shakes his head and said, hey, uh, I used to have a tractor like that once. Okay, dumb story. But it's got an important point that whether it's a small Vermont dairy farm or a giant Texas ranch, both cousins were describing their property by borders, the natural borders of rivers and woods or the artificial borders of road, town line or perimeter fence. A border is one way to keep cattle together, but it's not the only way. A few years ago, I shared with the Essex Church uh, about sociologist Paul Hybert, who talks about bounded communities, a community that defines itself by its boundaries, fences, walls that might be geographic or behavioral or based on appearance or belief structures. Boundaries give people a convenient way to tell who is in and who is out, who belongs and who doesn't. Do you all remember Dr. Seuss's book, The Sneetches? Uh, for those of you who didn't grow up on Dr. Seuss, there was a line in it that went something like this. Now the star-bellied Sneetches had bellies with stars, but the plain-bellied Sneetches had none upon thars. <clears throat> and because they didn't have stars on their bellies, which may seem kind of arbitrary, uh, some were in and some were out. So bounded communities choose some thing, it might be arbitrary or it might not be, to define who is in and who is out of community. Now it's with that mindset that Jesus' disciples were operating in when they saw the man born blind in the story from John's gospel. When they saw the man born blind, they saw someone defined as outside community, on the wrong side of the border, of the wall, of the boundary. And their question because of that was not, how do we love this guy? How do we include this guy? It was, who is to blame for his outsiderness? Is it his own fault or someone else's? Let me give you another uh, image about bounded communities. Um, I'll go back to the rancher for a moment. Um, if you have an enormous ranch like the ones out west or, or in the south and you're keeping your cows in with a fence, one of the things that you have to do is maintain that fence. And what happens over time is that someone who wants to be a rancher actually finds themselves being a fence fixer. You spend all your time fixing fences instead of spending your time tending to the cows that are inside. And I think that's an amazing metaphor for our own institutions and even for those disciples that they were more concerned about being clear about the fence. Who's the person who sinned for this man to be blind than they were about the fact that his blindness might be an opportunity for God's healing. And it's easy for us 2000 years later to sort of scoff at those disciples and say, can you believe that they didn't get it? Can you believe that they didn't know that they were supposed to be about loving? But I think it's really easy for us to do the same thing, that we too get into this place, that we can get, as soon as we form a community of people, as soon as we form an, form an organization or form a church, we start figuring out what are the rules, who's in, who's out, what are our bylaws, what are our traditions, what are the things that we use to 
keep ourselves together and in, as the Presbyterians would say, in good order. Um, and that has its place. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. I think the catch gets to when we start to focus more on what keeps us in good order than focusing on what is it that we're supposed to be about altogether. So we're not thinking about what draws us together. We're just thinking about what is it that constrains us or, or gives us channels to predictably move in. I think what happened to those disciples is that they forgot that they were supposed to be lovers. And I think the same thing can happen to us as church folk. We can forget that we're not just about fixing the boundary. We're about being people who love in the world, that that's who Jesus calls us to be. And that's when we are at our best as people of faith. And that's the alternative to a bounded community. And that's what the sociologist Hebert or Hybert calls the centered community, which is defined not by its boundaries, but by its center. Or in your example, it's not by fences that limit, but by life-giving wells that attract. The, the wells that are dug instead of fences being built have a gravitational attraction for the cattle and they never want to stray away from that which gives light. In a centered community, there are no gatekeepers. There is no fence mending. There's just people who are slowly being pulled ever closer toward a center. And as people draw closer to a center, they also find themselves closer to one another. In a really healthy virus In a healthy virus foot kind of boundary way. kind of way, absolutely. <laughs> uh, you can be further or closer away from the center. Uh, everyone knows that they're constantly working on that, uh, but there's no, no one's outside a fence. No one, there is no us versus them. Everyone is still looking toward the center and defined by the heart of that group. The cattle in your illustration are defined by the well around which they gather to drink. Uh, and in a community of faith, well, we'll talk a little bit about what our center is in a moment. The problem is the, the default easiest way to define a community and even a community of faith is by boundaries. Uh, but the church is meant to be a centered community, not a bounded community. Uh, as Paul wrote, uh, there is no us or them in the kingdom of God. There is uh, there's no in out thinking in the kingdom. Uh, in God's kingdom, uh, Paul wrote, there is no Greek or Roman. There is, I'm sorry, that should be new, no Jew or Greek, no slave or free, no male or female, for all are one in Jesus Christ. Uh, nobody is kept out because of their beliefs not being perfect or their outlooks not being perfect or their appearance not being perfect. Everyone can be loved. And everyone belongs no matter what stage of brokenness or redemption they are in. So back to our story from John. Jesus replies to his disciples that neither the man born blind nor his parents sinned. And by saying that, Jesus is rejecting the bounded community concept of who's in or who's out. He said instead that the works of God must be made manifest in him. And I think what Jesus is saying there is that the community is called to do all it can to help the man born blind to become fully the child of God that he is called to be, to be whole, belonging, beloved. And with a, a little bit of spit and a little bit of mud, again, this is not the safest uh, behaviors to be doing during a, a pandemic, but a little spit and a little mud and a whole lot of love. Uh, Jesus welcomed the man into belonging and says, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent, but the root word is shalom, which means peace, wholeness, connection, community. John's gospel tells us because he was loved the way he was loved, the man comes back seeing. And we can find those centers in all kinds of ways. So I wanna tell you a story that happened to me this week. Uh, Friday morning, I was out getting some groceries and I was in the Shaw's in Colchester. 
Uh, and in the produce section, I reached to get a, a bag of clementines. They're on sale this week at Shaw's, just letting you know. Um, and the woman next to me suddenly turned to me and laughed and said, oh, I'm so glad I saw you reach for those clementines because I wasn't really paying attention and I almost picked up a bag of oranges instead. And then as she, she so she grabbed her clementines and as she turned back to her cart, she, I heard her say this TBI thing. And I stopped her and I said, do you have a traumatic brain injury? And she said, yes, I had a concussion in February. And I said, oh, I'm a traumatic brain injury survivor. And so we started having this conversation about um, some of the limitations she had. And I, I was telling her how in the first year after my head injury, the grocery store was just completely overwhelming. And, and so we were sharing about a variety of things. We talked for maybe five or 10 minutes right there in front of the Clementines. Um, and it was fun, you know, it was wonderful. I'm always glad to share with folk um, what my experience has been, folk who are in what I call the, the brain injury club, um, because that's how we help each other out. Um, and so that was fine. And then at the very end of our, of our conversation, she turned to me and we, were, we had been joking. We were standing like five feet apart, maybe not six, but you know, we were joking about it. She looked at me and she went like this. And she said, this is me giving you a hug. And we, you know, we couldn't hug each other, but we stood in front of each other at the grocery store and went, hug. <laughs> and her gesture to do that, um, that just melted my heart. That made me feel so connected to her. And so for, our, for us, the bounded community was that we each had had a common experience in our own way. And our desire to share that with each other so that each of us could live fully into whatever our future would be. That made us a bonded community. Um, give me a moment. And, and so that sense of how we're connected as people um, was really important to me that morning. Um, and it made me think more about what it is in this time. How are we church folk? Um, this is a weird time for us, and all the things that we usually think of as our usual boundaries have gotten blown out of the water, and then new boundaries have been imposed on us, literally six-foot boundaries, literally not connect, not being in the presence of people boundaries. And I think it makes us think over and over again. I've seen so much of this online and in Facebook and in the news what is it that's really important to us and about us? I think people everywhere are asking that, and especially people in communities of faith are asking that. Without worrying too much about our fences, what is the center that draws us together, whether we can physically be with each other or not? Um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez wrote a book called Love in the Time of Cholera, and I feel like what we're trying to do is invent love in the time of coronavirus. How do we love each other when we can't necessarily be with each other, even the people that we love the most? I believe that God has created us with such a desire to connect, not only to God, but also to each other, that when we're not able to connect physically, we're impelled to find ways to connect by phone, by shouting to each other from one porch to the next, by taking walks safely six feet apart, <laughs> all the ways that we can show each other that we love and that we care and that that is essential to what our centered community is about in this time. As we were coming home from walking the dog in the woods yesterday, uh, our street had more people on it than I think I've ever seen That's because true. people are so needing to get out of the house. And outdoors is safe and everyone's keeping six feet apart. But I was seeing the, the deep, deep hunger for connection, for community, for love as people pass. Nobody passed with their eyes to the ground. Everyone was making eye contact, was waving, was making conversation from a safe six foot distance. There is a gravitational well of love that is at our center. And that is the well of love that is also at the center of church, at the center of Christian community. Uh, Barbara Brown Taylor, wonderful Christian writer, says that our center is 
the one in whose presence you know who you really are, the good and bad of it, the all of it, the hope in it. And Diana Butler Bass, a Christian sociologist, says that spirituality is all about finding that spiritual gravitational center. Who am I in God? Whose am I in God? And paradoxically, that means it connects us to others. Uh, she writes, Christians do not pray to have wishes granted. Christians pray to find themselves in God that they might be more aware of their motives and actions. Why do we worship? Not to be entertained, but to be in Jesus' presence and come to know ourselves better. Why do we serve others? Not to earn heavenly credit, but to find Jesus in our neighbors and such proximity enables greater insight to live fully in the world. We do what we do because we are in that gravitational field of love. That is what is at our center, the God who is love, the God who we meet in Jesus, the rabbi from Nazareth, the one whom Augustine called the Trinitarian God who is love, the beloved, and the lover. It's with that at our center that we worship today. It's with that at our center that we go to do what we do all through the week. And we have uh, an invitation for you for this week, right? So when I lead tending the fire retreats and often when I do um, church workshops, I'll ask people to share what is the scripture that you turn to when you really need to get grounded again, when everything else is falling apart? What's the scripture that you just know will be there no matter what? Um, or if not everybody can pull a scripture out of the uh, out of their heads. So what is the phrase of a song or what is what is a saying or a poem that you can turn to that will root you and ground you in who you are at your best? And it's always fascinating and um, such a gift when folks share that uh, that scripture, that song together. So this morning, I want to share with you that for me, that scripture is Romans 8:28. All things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to God's purpose. I know that I've shared that with the community in Morrisville in this past week. Um, that scripture is what I turn to. And even this last week when there was one evening where I had kind of had it um, mm -hmm. and was at the kitchen chopping something up for dinner and um, yeah, just aware of how thin I had become. And that scripture popped into my head. And as I recited that to myself, chopping onions, um, I could feel the tightness in my heart loosen. And it just gave me a breath. I just took a breath um, and a, a chance to say, yes, even in this, there will be good. God works all things together for good. That is my go-to scripture when I, my back is against the wall. So what's yours, Mitch? <clears throat> I think uh, the Essex folk know that for me, it's uh, Micah 6, 8, uh, which answers the question, what does the Lord require? Which might sound a little bit demanding. Uh, you know, O mortal, what is good? And it is just this, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God, which might seem like it's a fairly demanding piece. Uh, you could be in a mindset of, I need to do more justice. I need to love more kindness. I need to walk more humbly. Uh, but what I've been leaning on lately is that, you know, O mortal, what is good. And it's just this. You don't need to spin your wheels. You don't need to be asking, what more, what more, what more? Just love, kindness, do justice, walk humbly. It's be in God's presence, chill out, and what needs to come will come from that. So uh, in this time when it's very tempting, well, almost all the ministries we're doing right now feels like we're doing it with two hands tied behind our backs because 
all the things we do normally, we can't be doing because we can't be holding hands. We can't be praying physically with people. We can't be out doing the things we normally do. And it feels weird and it's exhausting not doing it. And I need to keep coming back to, you know what is good, but what does the Lord require? And I'm finding that very comforting. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a challenge for you all this coming week, and that is for you to think about what is your scripture or song or poem or whatever. What is the phrase, the group of words, something that pulls you back to who you are at your best, that reminds you what it is that God is asking for you to do and for you to be in the world? Um, I'm asking you to think about this for your own selves because there's something about reminding us, reminding ourselves that makes it easier for that to come up when we need it. And I also want to invite you, invite you to share those things um, with us in a couple of ways. So um, put, post them on the Facebook pages of our respective churches, or if you like, uh, email or text them to me or to Mitch. And if you're really brave, Find another person in your church community and share this with them. It might be someone who lives in your home, but if you're really, really brave, uh, share it with somebody who's not someone who lives with you. Because that is how we help to knit each other together, especially in this time of distance. That's how we become the embodied love in this time of coronavirus. So, um, we hope that these reflections have been helpful for you. I hope that that practice is helpful for you and for your spirit. And as always, thank you for joining in, for listening to this, for being uh, communities that we are blessed to be able to serve in these challenging and interesting times. May we be blessed in all this. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Another way. Howdy, we experienced a short technical glitch there, but we are back on and want to invite you to a time of prayer. Uh, Barb and I will be sharing a, a prayer from Walter Brueggemann. Uh, and as we prepare for that prayer, I would like you to uh, put any prayer requests that you are able to uh, on the comment section on the side of the Facebook Live page, and we will. Uh, try to read those uh, if the scrolling is doable. Uh, this is uh, the part I have the least expertise in, so uh, we'll see how that goes. But I invite you to a time of prayer, and if you have prayer requests, please put them uh, up on the side of the scroll there. But uh, oh, let's gather into a time of prayer to finish our worship time. O oh God, we arrange our lives as best we can to keep your holiness at bay with our pieties, our doctrines, our liturgies, our moralities, our secret ideologies, safe, virtuous, settled, bounded, fenced, enclosed. And then you, you and your dreams, you and your visions, you God and your purposes, you and your commands, you and our neighbors, you and the stranger, you. We find your holiness not at bay, but probing, pervading, insisting, demanding. And we yield 
sometimes gladly, sometimes resentfully, sometimes too late or too soon. We yield because you, beyond us, are God. We are your creatures met by your holiness, by your holiness made our true selves. And so we lift to you these prayers, God. From the community in Morrisville, we lift to you the family of Pat Draper, who passed away last Sunday on her 92nd birthday, surrounded by family and friends. We pray for her family as they wait until at least May for her service because of all of the constraints upon our lives these days. We lift up Audrey Stiles, a good friend of Pat's, who misses her and who grieves along with us this day. And we lift to you all of those who are affected by these strange days and this health threat, those for whom the anxieties are so great, those who are especially vulnerable, including the homeless, our homeless veterans. We lift to you all those who are tasked with helping us through this crisis, especially healthcare workers and first responders, scientists, those who lead our towns and states and nation. And we lift to you our churches, that we might be united in spirit, even as we are separate physically in distance. We lift up from Catherine. We pray for Sherry with terminal pulmonary disease, for Tom who is in alcohol rehab for the second time, for those shouldering burdens far beyond their present mental and emotional capacity. We pray for Barb Myers, who is back with her family, back home uh, after her rehab from a broken hip. Online from Liz, loving God, thank you for the boundless spirit of your human creations, the drive to be our best selves, especially when things are the worst and the creativity to bear them out. Thank you for the amazing faith communities that we are able to share with technology and those who help make it happen. And also from Morrisville, thank you for those putting this on the feed this morning. Um, for Audrey Marsh's family, and especially for any of those who find anxiety to be ruling their lives in ways that they can barely contain in these difficult days. Hear these prayers as we lift them to you, Lord, and hear us as we share together in the prayer that you taught to us, Jesus. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive, forgive those who trespass, who trespass against us. us. And, and lead us not into temptation, temptation but deliver, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So I want to offer you one other prayer thing for this coming week. Um, I've been, I do a lot of work in um, diminishing anxiety. So those of you who are having anxious times, by all means, call or text me and we'll talk this week. Um, but one of the techniques that I find helpful, or when I call it, a, let's call it a spiritual practice and not a technique, um, is what's called a breath prayer, where you say words as you breathe in, and then you say words again as you breathe out. And you say words as you breathe in and words as you breathe out, and the same words over and again. And often that is one way to help to still our spirits in hard times. And so um, one of the breath prayer phrases that we would like to share with you this day is, we are not alone, God is with us. We are not alone, God is with us. We are not alone, God is with us. And as you say that prayer, you can shorten it down to not alone, with us, or even we, 
and God, however that works for you. And to help you with this, um, on both of the worship pages that we sent to you last night, um, and also um, on the Facebook page, we'll have the link, I think it's already on the Morrisville page, is a YouTube video, video to a congregation that's singing a song called, We Are Not Alone, God Is With Us. I will warn you right now that it's an incredibly infectious earworm. And so as you listen to it, it will likely get stuck in your head for a day at least. On the other hand, it's a really wonderful thing to have stuck in your head. And so if you wish to see that on YouTube, we can't figure out a way to make that part of this broadcast without violating all sorts of copyright rules. But you can certainly go to the link and look, look it up on your own. And may that be part of what helps you in the coming week. There were two more prayers that came in while we were praying uh, from, from Heidi, a prayer for Angela who fell and broke her jaw and a long and difficult recovery ahead and from Krista for a family of a beloved co-worker who suddenly passed. Um, and also one uh, from Judy Bickford, the Mitchell family, especially Mariah. Thank you for sending these in. Sorry, it's been a little choppy. Uh, <clears throat> in our worship in Essex, we usually have announcements with birthdays and stuff. And we have a few birthdays this week uh, for Grant Corson, who is missing hugs terribly for Vicki Casaza, Judy Wright, Nick Duff, and Donna Paffrath this week. Our treasurer would like to remind both churches that uh, uh, our pledges are still needed and to please send them in uh, because the expenses of the churches are continuing. Uh, I will send out the address uh, for that uh, in a newsletter uh, this afternoon. So you will have that with you. I don't know if there are any other announcements. No one has sent anything else in. I think we're good. Then, brothers and sisters, I would like to end with uh, the last words of John Wesley, who on the day he died, surrounded by friends, said, best of all, God is with us. Mm -hmm. That is our gravitational center. So whether you're going to be feeling stuck at home or whether you're going to spend some time outside with a proper six foot distance between others, as you are practicing physical distancing, again, we ask that you create social bridges, human to human, each of us to creation and to God, to go in the name of the God who is creator and redeemer and sustainer now and forever. Amen. Amen. Peace, y'all. Thanks for being with us.